what I think is fascinating about the Secret Service in part is that we do see them. Unlike CIA agents, we see Secret Service agents doing some of their work, and I think we partly think that we understand them or know them. Uh, in reality, theirs is a very complex story, a very complex organization, and, uh, and yes, even enigmatic, as the, um, as the subtitle suggests. Um, Laura asked me to say a little bit about the, um, the project itself. The project was written almost a year to this day. Uh, I think it was November 16 that the actual writing began. But you'll recall that I had been doing research previously on the Secret Service for a number of years. And um, <clears throat> having Peter Stevens um, to wordsmith the project, of course, while I was doing uh, the other tasks, made it go along much faster uh, than if there were simply one person working on it. And <clears throat> the, um, the sources used, um, very briefly, one of the rich sources were the memoirs of Secret Service agents themselves, retired agents, and the biographies and memoirs of ex-presidents and their chiefs of staff. All of them in one way or another had something to say about their interactions with this agency, so that was a good starting point. Uh, there were some excellent government reports that were publicly available, believe it or not, and even some from think tanks like the Rand Corporation, analyzing White House security and talking about the history of uh, presidential protection. I did use the Freedom of Information Act to obtain documents regarding President Kennedy's assassination and the Secret Service's protective role therein, and also documents pertaining to the attempted assassination of President Ronald Reagan uh, in 1981. And then there were the interviews, which is the richest part of the book, even though the interviews are not many. Uh, they are hopefully very rich. The, um, the interviews with retired agents, the interviews with present agents, and the interviews with politicos, White House campaign people, uh, presidential campaign people, who worked on the political trail interacting with, with uh, Secret Service agents. So it is a history from 1865 to the present, but we've pulled out of that history the uh, successes and failures, the major tragedies and triumphs that the Secret Service has had from the assassination of President Kennedy to what happened to the agency in the wake of 9-11 and, and all of the events along the way. This was difficult in a project in terms of getting information. Um, they don't call it the Secret Service for nothing. It is a secretive organization and does not like to talk about its work, does not like to reveal its methods, obviously. <clears throat> and then there is the code, uh, which Secret Service culture refers to, the code that says that um, ex-agents and current agents will not talk about two subjects. One is the personalities and foibles of the individuals that they protected, and second is um, how they go about their work. So anyone seeking to get first-hand information is, is confronting the code, and it's, it's not an easy code to break. Worse for <clears throat> this author, however, um, I ran into a double whammy, if you will, in that this was in the wake of 9-11. And because of 9-11, the Secret Service was so overmatched and understaffed that they virtually gave up talking to the public. In fact, in, in um, some frustrated moments, I would tell anyone who would listen that they should change the name of their public affairs office to private affairs or internal affairs because they weren't responding to at least this public uh, and it was very difficult to, to get information. In fact, I had one agent from Public Affairs uh, return a phone call, which was a joy, uh, and he candidly told me that if it wasn't for the fact that I knew somebody who knew somebody in his office, that this phone call would not be happening because there wasn't time for it. And in fact, he ended up answering about 40% of the questions that I posed to him. He also said very candidly, look, everybody with a badge and a gun in this office, public affairs, is out protecting somebody at this point. So I ran into that problem as well, that there was no functioning public affairs and there was the, <clears throat> the code of silence. And all but two of the agents that I talked to came from networking with other people, uh, whether they retired or present. Only in two cases did I approach somebody successfully who would talk to me as an author, as a political scientist. The rest of it was, was pure networking and it was difficult at that. And more agents declined to talk to me than talk to me, which is, of course, their perfect right to do so. Let me talk a little bit about the history <clears throat> before getting to the more current events. Um, the Secret Service was created in 1865, and it was the last official act of Abraham Lincoln before he was assassinated. 
In fact, that afternoon, before he went to Ford's Theater uh, to be assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, he met with the Secretary of Treasury, and they agreed on the creation of the Secret Service. Uh, now, some think that that's a sad historical irony in the sense that here's a president about to be assassinated. They create an agency to protect presidents, but it doesn't do them any good. Well, indeed, um, the Secret Service was not created to protect presidents. In fact, it was created solely to protect something that the system may have valued um, more highly than, than the lives of its political leaders, and that is our money. Uh, counterfeiting during the Civil War was so endemic that the, the actual currency system was threatened. So that's what the Secret Service was, was formed to do. And um, by the late, 18, <coughs> excuse me, late 1860s, we had two dozen swashbuckling agents running about the country with the guns that they had purchased on their own, uh, seeking out the counterfeiters. And their, their badges, if you will, their identification, their bona fides, consisted of a letter from the Secretary of the Treasury to each of them saying, so-and-so is a bona fide Secret Service agent. Well, it didn't take the bad guys long to catch on to that. And one of them wrote the Secretary of Treasury, got a response, lifted the signature, put it on a letter of his own concoction, walked into a Secret Service field office, and essentially said, hi, as you can see, I'm here at behest of the Secretary of Treasury. Open your safe, give me all your seized counterfeit bills, and by the way, throw in the good cash as well, and I'll take that back to Washington. Uh, fortunately for the service, they discovered the scam before they opened the vault to this individual, but then someone thought it would be a good idea to issue badges. So badges were issued, and in fact, they're the very distinctive five-point um, shields that are still on the Secret Service shield and logo today. And agents um, in 1871 had to purchase their own badges for $25, which is a lot of money then. The good news was they got the money back when they retired if they turned in their badges. <clears throat> the, um, it's a very colorful history. I just give you some of the headlines. The Secret Service battled the Ku Klux Klan in the rim states in the immediate uh, aftermath of the Civil War. They were just a law enforcement agency on hand who, who took up that role. They were our chief spying agency and counter-spy agency in World War I. They broke German spy rings quite successfully. They were what the CIA or the FBI would be today, and, and they had that sole responsibility, uh, which they would later um, lose. <clears throat> and. So you might be wondering, when did they start protecting presidents and candidates and political leaders? Um, the first instance was 1894, and it's very interesting because it was the head of the Secret Service himself, uh, William Hazen, who on his own decided that he'd heard some rumblings in Colorado that some criminal types might have a grudge against President Cleveland. So on his own, he assigned two agents to the Cleveland White House. Without asking the Secretary of Treasury, without congressional authorization, the two agents just showed up. Well, evidently, the First Lady thought that was a dandy idea uh, because that summer of the same year, without telling her husband, the President, uh, she went to the Secret Service and asked them for agents to come to their summer home, which was up the road here in, in Marion, and to protect the family, especially the children, during the summer because she feared a kidnapping. So when President um, when the president showed up at his uh, summer home, uh, he was surprised to find Secret Service agents, but he, he accepted it. Now, you might think that given the birth of that idea and the notion of agents being present, protecting presidents and first families, that it was a linear curve or a, a straight line evolution to the present, but, but not so. The protective mission evolved in fits and starts, and it was for a long time not clear that it would be a mission and that it would be their mission. Uh, for example, Congress, elements of Congress had a, an antipathy to giving agents over to the White House. They worried that it was another presidential perk, that presidents were going to have a, some sort of a police force or a, an armed force at their disposal, and they just didn't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> they forbid it at certain times, in fact. And presidents themselves, some of them, weren't always sure they wanted Secret Service protection. Uh, imagine Warren G. Harding when he discovered that the investigation that brought down his administration, the Teapot Dome scandal, and sent his Secretary of the Interior to jail was spearheaded by Secret Service agents. And so they were less than welcome in the Harding White House after that. Um, Franklin D. Roosevelt flirted seriously with the idea of using FBI agents to protect him 
instead of Secret Service agents. Of course, this was at the behest of J. Edgar Hoover, who wanted every federal mission to be his and nobody else's. But the president um, gave some indications of trying to respond to that. So it wasn't until 1951 that Congress finally passed the permanent authorization for the Secret Service to protect presidents and provided the, um, the annual funding for it. And um, that caused Harry Truman to quip, quote, the work of protecting me has at last become legal, unquote. And the Secret Service is a dual mission organization. Um, it still does anti-counterfeiting. And by the way, uh, anti-counterfeiting doesn't roll off my tongue really well. So I'm going to talk about the counterfeiting mission, but I, I don't intend the image of Secret Service agents in their basement cranking out $100 bills. They even call it the, the counterfeiting mission. They do both. They protect political leaders as, as assigned by the president. They protect national security events, and they also protect the currency from electronic theft as well as duplication. Not only does the organization do that, but individual agents do that as well. You are trained to do both missions when you undergo training. Your career will involve both missions. You'll start three to five years in a field office doing mostly counterfeiting. You will then go into protective work uh, for a period of years doing that and then go back uh, to doing counterfeiting. So there is that, that dual mission. Um, I wanted to emphasize the politics. I think it's, it's certainly very interesting. The protective mission takes place in the political cauldron that is presidential politics. And um, the conflict between the protectors and the politicos is absolutely inevitable, as, as I'm sure you can see. The politicos want the perfect camera angle, the ideal photo shoot. They want the largest crowds possible looking spontaneous. They want the, the best motorcade route that will give them access. They want locations that look good. The protectors want a 360 degree circle around the president that nobody could get into except them. Uh, they want no spontaneity if they can avoid it. They want the crowds kept back as far as possible and they want agendas that they can control. So obviously uh, this is a conflict. I mean, when you see a Secret Service agent hanging on to President Clinton's belt buckle, belt from behind, as he greets the crowd, um, that agent's going to be in every photo op where the president is, and, and uh, the politicos don't necessarily like that. But what I discovered is that it's a very interesting relationship, and it's one of negotiation, that the political people will tell you, they didn't go and yell at the Secret Service and say, look, here's what we have to do. They would go to them and, and explain, and the service would say the same thing. You didn't just go to the president of the campaign and say, look, cancel that stop or change this route. You said, here are five good reasons why we think it's too dangerous. You know, let's negotiate. And it is a negotiative process. Of course, as in any human process, it sometimes breaks down. And uh, I did run into politicos who had less than kind things to say about Secret Service agents being fascist automatons and Secret Service agents who... Uh, would say that some of the people they protected just were so reckless it, it almost seemed as if um, they didn't care what happened to them and, and there was a lot of that. But basically it was a, um, a situation of mutual respect and, and negotiation. I'm not going to go through all the crises of the, of the Secret Service, but <clears throat> I want to highlight some of them. Um, you can look forward to reading about them. There is, of course, the, the worst crisis was the JFK assassination, the first time they lost a president uh, since they had been protecting presidents. And I think the bottom line of that, a lot of research into it, is that um, the Secret Service was woefully unprepared for that challenge uh, in terms of the planning of the event, in terms of their reaction, in terms of the procedures that were in place. And um, they learned from that, certainly, and, and improved greatly. But I have to say, by way of footnote, that that learning was somewhat retarded by their attempts to cover up their ineptitudes and to cover up what had happened uh, with regard to their failures to protect the president. But it's a good story. The, um, let, me, let me continue on if I might. Um, the assassination, attempted assassination of President Reagan in 1981 um, is, is the most recent instructive detailed case that we have. And the good news here is that um, the heroic, quick thinking of agents at the crime scene, uh, within 10 seconds of the first shot, 
President Reagan was in the limousine and on his way to, well, first to the White House, but then when they discovered that he was wounded, he was on the way to the hospital. And we've all seen the picture of uh, courageous agent Timothy McCarthy making himself a large target and taking a bullet for the president as he was trained to do, as they all were trained to do. So at the crime scene, it, they did wonderfully in terms of procedure and reaction. The problems were twofold, that after getting the president safely away, there were failures to back up security, there were failures in communication that if this had been more than a lone deranged individual, uh, could have put the president at further risk by leaving him relatively unprotected. And then at the other end of it, there, there's the question that needs answering, which is, how does a deranged individual um, with a gun get within 20 feet of the president, um, fire six shots and wound four people before he can be stopped? And, and there were certainly failures in, in that regard. One of the greatest crises of the Secret Service, or at least its culture, came not from guns or bullets, but from the subpoenas of uh, Special Counsel Kenneth Starr in the Monica Lewinsky uh, case. Ken Starr wanted Secret Service agents to testify before a grand jury. Uh, what did they know? What did they see? The Secret Service fought this tooth and nail all the way to the Supreme Court. Agents even came out of their their code, if you will, and went on talk shows, uh, retired agents talking about um, how devastating this would be. They weren't trying to protect the Clinton presidency. They weren't trying to cover up criminality. Their main uh, fright was that that fragile bond of trust and confidentiality between the agents and the people they protect would be shattered by these subpoenas. Um, I mean, simply put, um, they want to be within one to three to feet of who they're protecting and if that if the who they're protecting is going to think to themselves I can't listen have them listening to this conversation with my wife or this conversation with my manager because it may end up in court someday move 12 feet away then they're going to be outside the zone at which they can do anything uh, to protect the president and they're very aware of this in fact that kind of worry had come even before the subpoenas there were candidates who mistrusted Washington, George Wallace comes to mind, uh, the outsider who mistrusted the Washington establishment, who would tell the Secret Service to get at a, a large distance, to keep away from conversations. So they were very worried that this would happen. And the effect is unknown to us because it's behind the scenes. Um, whether people's memoirs and, and writings a decade from now will say the bond of trust remained, it didn't seem to be impinged upon, or whether there were a lot of instances in which candidates or the president said, get at a distance, we, we just don't know. Um, the, the last and most immediate crisis was, of course, <clears throat> the uh, terrorist attacks. And uh, um, we sp the book spends a good deal of time analyzing how that affected the service. But let me just say, um, <clears throat> the Secret Service um, can protect anyone that the president assigns them to. That's it. The president can assign anyone protection. And the good news is that that privilege has not been abused over the years. There has not been a president who said, I have a big contributor that would like to see what it's like to be protected by the Secret Service. Go protect him for the weekend. Or uh, somebody in my family would think it would be fun. They haven't done that, and it's been very good. But as you might imagine, in the wake of the terrorist attacks, uh, President Bush massively increased the number of protectees that the Secret Service had to deal with. And it, it extended to, I don't have the list because it's classified, but I do know in talking to people that it certainly extended to the congressional leadership, uh, to Secretary of State Colin Powell, to National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, and as one agent told me almost incredulously, and to Dr. Rice's assistant. Um, so the list had perhaps doubled, even tripled overnight. And as if that weren't a problem enough, um, we stretched the Secret Service thin by um, having anything that the president defines as a national security event can be uh, under the aegis of Secret Service protection. So the Super Bowl was under Secret Service protection. The Winter Olympics in Utah were under Secret Service protection. Now, that worked terrifically without incident, but, but imagine hundreds of agents securing, you know, miles of snowfield in Utah with the bomb-sniffing dogs, the counter-sniper teams, uh, all of the metal detectors, and um, these were agents who might have been doing other work if they weren't doing that. So there's a, a tremendous overwork um, of the agents, and I think at some point somebody has to decide, 
Is the Secret Service going to be involved in every national crisis? Or are we going to divide the labor more? They, they even assigned 50 field agents uh, from the Washington office to the sniper case, which, which sounds like it makes sense and that you're doing everything you can to, keep, to catch the sniper. But you have to consider where the, um, where the human resources are coming from. The best estimate that I could get was that around the time of the terrorist attacks, there were 2,700 Secret Service agents. 2,700. Um, today, it's surely more than that, but it's not as if they can conscript them and, and crank them out in great volume. In John Kennedy's era, there were 300 Secret Service agents, so you could think that a 900% increase sounds good, but in John Kennedy's era, the list of protectees was already very short, and the threats from terrorists and the, the complicated nature of the world um, was not nearly what it is now. And to show you how stressed they were already, um, it is a traditional practice in the Secret Service, in presidential campaigns, when there's two or three Republicans running, two or three, three or four Democrats, they don't have enough agents to protect all of these candidates, so they borrow agents from other agencies, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, customs, the IRS. They were already doing that when they were protecting the, the shortlist before um, it was extended in 9-11. The um, part of the human factor is the, the agents themselves. I need it be said that this is a very stressful job. Um, that an eight-hour shift at this job may be unlike many others, uh, obviously some in law enforcement, but being ready at a split second to determine if it's a balloon, a firecracker, or a 22 caliber gun, being ready to make that decision about whether you jump on the protectee, knock them down, and, and cover them to everybody's embarrassment if it's a balloon, or do you wait a second to think about it and find out that it is a gun and it's too late, um, standing for hours on fixed duty waiting for a particular noise or a particular stimulus, scanning the crowds to look for motion or for eye contact or for the pictures of people who are on your list. This is, is very, very difficult work. And they do talk about burnout considerably, and, and that's why there is some limit to the, um, to the length of protective duty, but I'm not sure what that limit is. They, they talk about, in one sense, it being limited to three or five years, but then some agents in their, in their memoirs will say, well, first I protected President um, Carter, and then uh, there was um, <clears throat> President Reagan, and then I got a little bit into uh, President Bush number one. So, so some of them do stay around um, for a long time. Besides the inherent stress, it's a, um, it's a difficult career to pursue. Um, as one agent told me, the, the, the inside joke was if the Secret Service wanted you to have a family, they would have issued you one. Uh, and the other shibboleths are, you will travel and you will relocate. And I came to understand this in, in the wake of 9-11 um, when I was at a field office and they were explaining to me the assignments of agents and some of them were in Utah and had been for weeks and some of them were in the Middle East with a protective detail. I mean, you go where the protectee goes. I mean, if you're in President Clinton's detail and he decides, um, former President Clinton, and he decides he's going to go to South Africa, that's where you're going to end up and you don't get to uh, uh, postpone it because of your daughter's birthday. So all in all, it is, it is difficult. And I, I'm, um, there have been more incidents lately than previously of agents um, getting into trouble, uh, is the category, I guess. And I, I, certainly the incidents that happen to a few agents should not tarnish the whole organization. I'm not suggesting that. But I'm suggesting that the newspapers are fuller of um, problems with agents in the last two or three years than in the previous ten years. You know, case of alleged airline rage that's still being worked out. Um, the tawdry spectacle of several agents in Vice President Cheney's detail getting into a barroom brawl with civilians um, while wearing their guns and badges, and when the police show up, they think that everybody's intoxicated and th these kinds of things. All I'm suggesting is that. Um, the Secret Service should look to its psychological infrastructure in the wake of, of their stress generally and, and how overstressed they are now and perhaps um, try to do something with that and hopefully they are. The, um, I have some recommendations in the book about how to make the Secret Service better and uh, one of them I knew would not fly. Um, but see, it's okay for professors to visit the ivory tower once in a while as long as they don't spend too long there. Um, I knew it wouldn't fly, and I knew it wouldn't fly because um, it went against the organization's tradition. My suggestion was 
to take a hard look at whether the counterfeiting mission should be severed from the protective mission and put someplace else in Treasury, leaving the Secret Service to do protective work exclusively. Um, and I knew it wouldn't fly because that's what they were created to do. It's their tradition. And they all have a mantra of, of two items, whether it's the former director, the current director, all the agents, they have a mantra that has two items about um, counterfeiting versus protection. And I will gladly accept the first one, but I will challenge the second one. The first one is anti-counterfeiting work is very professionally rewarding. And I'm prepared to accept that it is, of course. In fact, I had three agents tell me that they preferred the counterfeiting work to the protective work, which they found at times terribly boring. Uh, at least in counterfeiting, you're moving around, you know, it's, it's uh, detective work, and you're not standing in a hallway for five hours uh, staring at, at, the, um, at the walls. That I will accept. The second part of it is that the same skills that make a good anti-counterfeiting agent are the same skills that will make a good protector. Quick reactions, very good law enforcement judgment. And there may be something to that in that they're both law enforcement and involve guns, but I would submit to you that these are very different activities. That uh, putting a $20 bill under a microscope to see if Andy Jackson's tie is on straight um, going undercover to follow the money trail, breaking into a basement where the printing press is cranking are very fundamentally different activities from standing on the rope line, uh, waiting for that split-second reaction and, and scanning the crowd. Um, and um, I, I don't think we would have FBI agents who chase uh, terrorists or, or counter-terrorists uh, serve on the Border Patrol for three to five years. I don't think we'd require Navy SEALs or Green Berets to investigate crimes at Army and Navy bases for three to five years before they went on to, to do their hazardous duty. So it's something that needs looking at. So I knew it wouldn't fly, and here we get Homeland Security, um, a bill in which the, the most radical reorganization of the federal government in 50 years is about to take place, and the Secret Service is one of those 22 agencies that is proposed to be uprooted from its traditional bureaucratic home and placed in the Homeland Security Department. And I've heard nobody talk about leaving the counterfeiting mission behind. So the most radical bureaucratic change is taking place, without my recommendation, obviously, and still uh, it makes so much sense to leave counterfeiting behind in Treasury to be done by the Treasury Security Force or somebody it belongs in Treasury, and if it ends up in Homeland Security, um, I think that will have been an opportunity that, that was missed. Um, in closing, let me just say that um, I think you can't look at this organization in detail, least this analyst can't, without being impressed. Uh, if you think about the, um, the scandals and the blunders that have plagued some of the Secret Service's sister agencies in the federal government in the last five years, that's not the story here. Um, and what, when you look, what you see is a... Uh, an impressive cadre of well-trained, professional, patriotic people who are overworked and understaffed and sometimes even underappreciated, um, but do a very good job. Thank you. Thanks. Before, before we, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, if you would like to ask a question, now is the time to do it, but please raise your hand so that the microphone can make its way to you. And just pause a minute before you start. Okay, thank you. I believe you said that you started uh, your research in 1961. Why did you choose that year? No, I, th I had started my interest in the Secret Service about two decades ago, uh, that, which would have. In the book? Oh, it, in the book, it takes the Secret Service from its inception in 1865 uh, right up to post 9/11, and um, and everything good and bad that that happened to it in that in that era. Yeah. I worked for Treasury in Washington under the Kennedy administration, and was reading the tear tape when JFK was assassinated. I worked closely with Secret Service, Burl Peterson, who was head of the Secret Service then, and I really appreciate your book. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comment.
opportunity to observe any of the secret agents who are here working with President Clinton recently in New Bedford? No, I did not. I didn't. But I, I, I know students who did, and they told me some interesting stories. But yes. My grammar school history long ago, the idea that Lincoln leaped off the gallery of the Ford Theater to the floor below always struck me as somewhat of a prevarication. But I was in the Ford Theater, and distance is only about from that awning over there to that floor. It isn't much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he probably did. <laughs> Not sure. No, I didn't say not true. I said I didn't know. It was about Ford's theater and the physical layout. Thank you. If, <clears throat> if I understood correctly, it, it seemed that you were suggesting that agents kind of recirculate from the protective service to counterfeiting and back again from time to time. So that uh, if in some future time the, those two missions were split apart and put in separate auspices, what would happen, how would the protective service actually function if, as you suggested, agents kind of burn out and very quickly, what would happen to that? Uh, that's a very good question. They would have to devise ways, which I think are there, um, to rotate agents in various facets of the protective mission. There are a lot of things that they could do besides carrying a gun on the rope line. There, there are field offices, uh, there's protective research, protective intelligence. Uh, there's a lot of things that could be done, and they could be doing that instead of taking the, the downtime in the counterfeiting mission. I think it would work. I think it could be designed to work. Could you say something about the professional or the educational background of uh, potential Secret Service agents with the uh, accountants or police officers or military previous to going to Secret Service? Okay, I'll tell you what they say and I'll tell you what my, my feeling is. Uh, <clears throat> they, they will tell you, and it's true, that they encourage a wide range of applications. And as one Secret Service director said, we can use people from accounting, you didn't mention that specifically, uh, even from, from art school. That we have something for everybody. We retrain everybody. And that's probably true that among 2,700 agents, you could find a smorgasbord of, of majors that you might find at UMass Dartmouth. Having said that, um, if you think about it realistically, someone who comes to them with a law enforcement background or uh, special forces military training of some kind really has a leg up in the sense that, first of all, they've already been quite well security cleared, probably, and secondly, they bring to the job uh, a training that others don't have. And that's not to say that they're becoming an exclusively paramilitary organization, but I, I do think that they have a preference for some prior experience, although uh, they will take people from almost every walk of life, if you will. I'm not sure about the comparative data. Um, the, um, their general um, proportion of African Americans in the organization seems consistent with other agencies. There may be some difference, but it seems consistent. Within the organization, um, there's debate and conflicting evidence about what this means. For example, <clears throat> while President Clinton's um, Chief, chief of his detail, uh, Larry Cockrell, who is African American, is now the first African American assistant director in line to possibly come, become director. So that looks good. And then that's countered by the suit filed by um, several African American agents claiming that their promotions to the upper ranks of the bureaucracy were blocked because of their race. So you've got both things going on at once and it's a kind of continuing story and continuing struggle. Knowing of your extensive research into the assassination of Robert Kennedy, I can't resist asking a question about the events that occurred in 1968. Um, it seems to me that part of the story was that I believe Roosevelt Greer had been a kind of volunteer uh, lay bodyguard for uh, Bobby and... Uh, 
Was he uh, sufficiently protected by the Secret Service himself at that time? Well, <clears throat> no. The answer is definitely no, because Secret Service protection of presidential candidates was extended for the first time in reaction to Robert Kennedy's assassination. Previously, there had been no Secret Service protection of candidates until you got to be president. Um, there were other modes of protection, of course, uh, police and personal bodyguards, but Robert Kennedy did not want uniformed police or private security presence in his campaign for image reasons. And um, there was a kind of fatalism in that campaign whereby there wasn't a heavily armed cadre of, of Kennedy friends and associates. There was an ex-FBI agent named William Barry. It's not clear to me whether he typically was armed or unarmed. The, re the record is um, unclear on that. But he was the closest thing to a protector that Kennedy had. Roosevelt Greer and Rafer Johnson were called bodyguards, uh, but these were burly athletes who happened to um, be around the scene. They weren't systematically guarding him. always has fascinated me about the uh, Civil War era, of course, and leading up to uh, Lincoln's assassination, how lax or unconcerned there was for protection, especially what was going on in the country and the access. Uh, Lincoln traveling by himself or with his wife in a carriage. Uh, certainly, they must have had thought there would be, uh, you know, high chances of threats and so forth. What was the thinking back then? I, I don't know. It's, it's a fascinating uh, point. Um, here we are at war and a civil war at that, and battles are being fought within the shadow of the White House. And, and, and yet, except for troops on the White House lawn, um, Lincoln would go about in carriages with, with perhaps only one officer with a gun. It, it makes no sense to me. The, one of the fascinating things that, that's documented in the book, though, is that um, White House security uh, now, compared to um, the old days, is quite fascinating. I mean, they used to allow, in inauguration parties, the crowd used to spill into the White House and, and sort of take over and, and revel for, into the wee hours of the morning, and uh, uh, people would walk in in various administrations, Andrew Jackson and, and others, and come to the president's office and greet them, uh, or in one case, uh, slap them in the face, as happened to President Jackson. The, the amount of access and lack of protection to our, our older presidents uh, is really quite a fascinating story. And one of the fascinating stories is that except for President Lincoln and that tragedy, um, we had numerous presidents in the old presidency that, that virtually went through office without incident, even though people could walk on their lawn and, and open the door to the White House. So it's a different era. So I was just thinking that this, this just couldn't happen, that someone would harm the president in general? I don't know. If, there were, if I were there and there were a civil war in hindsight, I would be advising the president to, to uh, get some extensive guards. Uh, I mean, it would just make sense. Yeah. I have a question about the nature of the relationship between the FBI and the Secret Service, uh, particularly over time and as it has evolved. In your chapter on the JFK assassination, it's pretty clear that there wasn't a lot of information sharing. Has that changed uh, and you think that that sort of thing will be helped with the uh, Homeland Security Department? Is there going to be more cooperation between these agencies? There's definitely going to be more cooperation because the spotlight is on them and they've been ordered to have more cooperation and the previous resistance to cooperation is going to be tougher for the individual agencies to pursue. So yes, there's going to be more. Um, but whether it will be effective is, is another open question. It's not just uh, providing data, but it's what kind of data you provide. The, the Secret Service is dependent on other organizations for its data. It, it will investigate threats, threats come to it, but basically for terrorist threats it's dependent on the FBI and the CIA and other agencies and the form in which that information comes to them whether it's boiled down or it's massive and they can't read it um, is going to be an important question that probably has yet to be resolved. Good. Um, Short question, is there anything on your historical data reference to the Secret Service and John Garfield, Gar not John Garfield, but President Garfield, and, this, and more recently, the Puerto Rican nationalists when they tried to bag Truman? Uh, was it Truman or who? Is that the one? Yes, yes on the lawn. So was there any actual? So I've never heard any feedback from that in the intel community as to who did what, what did who, whether it was you know, how it went down either with Garfield and or Truman. Okay, well, the Garfield case... Um in another historical irony, there were two Secret Service agents at the train station 
when Garfield was, was assaulted and, and uh, fatally wounded, but again, they weren't doing presidential protection. They were just on their way to somewhere. Uh, in the Truman case, <clears throat> that was different in the sense that clearly um, that was a conspiracy and a politically motivated conspiracy. You have two Puerto Rican nationalists assaulting simultaneously, and um, um, the pre President Truman was never in very much danger given the... the um, the way things were set up and the guards that he had at Blair House, but it was one of those few instances that the Secret Service historically regards as a conspiracy because they can't deny that there were two gunmen coming at once. I happened to be in Providence Airport one day when Bobby Kennedy was discussing obviously things with a man on each side and they were walking down and up and down they they continued that for over half an hour now anybody with a small gun could have killed him anybody oh yes the <clears throat> i mean um we were talking earlier about uh protection of president lincoln the, the the campaigning style especially of robert kennedy if you've seen the films here's here's robert kennedy on the back of a limousine that's moving slowly and his, his entourage is holding him so he won't be pulled into the crowd. People are taking his cufflinks, tousling his hair. Um, it was as up close as, as you could possibly get. It was a, a, an era, a throwback era that we'll never see again on the campaign trail for sure. Um, given the um, secrecy of the Secret Service, how much do you think is really covered up today as, like example, last when the the latest sniper case in Washington there was a little tiny article in the paper saying that a man had jumped the fence at the White House and um, you know he was quickly caught and, and and skirted off and he left I just wonder how much of that stuff happens that we don't know about and how much is covered up by the Secret Service to make it you know not that they're not doing the job but to make it seem like everyone is safe you know that that the president that is always safe, even though I always find that amazing that people get into the White House, even during all of that. It well, <clears throat> um, let me answer. That's a good question. Let me answer it as as best I can. The um, the the Secret Service will not talk about cases of prevention or instances unless they have to. Um, they, they sometimes have to because when somebody jumps the fence and is arrested, it becomes a news item. When somebody takes a pot shot at the White House, then, then it's a news item. When somebody tries to crash a plane into the Clinton White House, it's a news item. Uh, so then they'll talk about it. So we don't know behind the scenes. I mean, I've seen it referred to that there are several threats a day against any president. So obviously there are thousands each year, and we know that as we watch the president, we fortunately have not seen an overt attack on the president of the United States, but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot going on behind the scenes. And um, they keep their own counsel in terms of how many plots do they prevent, um, uh, how many plots do we know about compared to what actually goes on, and um, um, the only thing we know about their record is when we see something, whether it's something goes wrong or something goes right. What about the protection of uh, individuals from the media? I mean, how often does that happen where these people assigned to protect people, protect them from the media? Mm -hmm. Does that go on? Um, I have some instances of that, but they're, they're old ones, and whether they whether there are modern ones, I don't know, but I haven't heard about them, but I'll, I'll give you the flavor of the older ones. Uh, at national conventions, for example, it's up to the Secret Service to uh, screen press credentials for who is a valid journalist and can, can get in and who can't get in, and there have been certain times at which some journalists have charged that this was purely a political screen rather than a safety screen, and that that function was being used to um, eliminate uh, troublesome journalists. The, um, um, and there have been lawsuits, in fact, filed against the Secret Service by some journalists for that exclusion. The, um, there have been politicizations of the Secret Service, but not many, as, as far as we can tell. My, I think the nadir of this uh, it comes from the Nixon administration, in which um, the White House detail was told by, by, the, um, by the Nixon White House people that when the president got heckled 
at a certain demonstration. They wanted sufficient heckling so the president looked challenged, but not sufficient heckling to drown him out. And so you would leave enough hecklers to make it look confrontational, the president would overcome, and you, you'd remove people uh, back who were heckling too much. Well, you've now turned them into advanced people. Uh, they're not doing protection anymore when they're, you know, when they have the heckle meter out and they're trying to figure out uh, if the president is looking good or not. So, but, but those are rare. I mean, unless they are not coming to our attention and they're going on all the time, and my suspicion is that they're, they're rare. Have you find there's been any any like pecking order on shields? Usually you go from local to state to federal, and if it's a military invention, then we got to put ours back and we have to defer because I find in the acronym agencies from Langley all the way up, there is a pecking order on who does what when it's in your jurisdiction, especially around D.C. The question is, did you find that there's a pecking order between Secret Service, the Langley, the Langley boys, and the, F the FBI, the whole crew, when something goes down, is there a pecking order that they deferred to, or are they going to just lump it under Homeland Security when it comes to something like what you're indicating? Well, um, that's a very complicated question. I have no idea what the configuration of Homeland Security is going to be and what the mutual responsibility agreements are going to be, and that'll be certainly fascinating to, to watch. There have been the traditional rivalries um, but let me put it this way. My sense is that, that the Secret Service has been relatively neutral by federal standards. That is, the contempt that um, the Central Intelligence Agency has held the FBI in over decades is well known in, in uh, law enforcement culture. Um, I don't get any of that sense about the Secret Service. They seem to be um, just there. I will say, however, that um, the Secret Service is very dependent on metropolitan police departments to do their work. They don't bring enough agents to Boston to take care of everything that needs doing. And they're very, they have to work with police departments and, and be very cooperative. And how to put it, um, it, there's a checkered pattern. Some municipalities have a great history of cooperation with the service, and others have a really rocky history. New York City comes to mind, at least in the 1980s, as, as being a place where, for whatever reason, and I'm not privy to that, uh, there would end up being shouting matches about who was going to cover a roof and, and uh, your people aren't taking guns up there because our people are and um, all sorts of kind of productive stuff like that. But we don't, we don't get to hear much about it. But again, it, it shows the dependency of this organization. Um, it, it, when it goes to a foreign country, um, it is, for better or for worse, very dependent on the security forces there. And whether they're corrupt or whether they're efficient, um, uh, they still have to depend on them to a certain extent. Question to ask you. Uh, listening to NPI radio tonight, I, I was uh, I understood that the uh, part of the Homeland Security Act has a provision where bookstores and libraries can have their records subpoenaed by the Justice Department to um, to look at what customers or people who use the library what type of reading uh, readings they do. Do you think um, that is going to be a useful uh, a useful tool in the effort to combat uh, terrorism, provide security? Well, I'm a bad one to answer that question because if they look at my list, uh, they're going to think that I'm plotting something terrible against the president. I mean, that's what, you know. Um, so um, uh, I, I don't, I really honestly, uh, let me say this. I, I think that um, part of the real problem is getting the quality of data, not the quantity of data. And I'm not sure that extensive reading lists flooding across our intelligence transom are going to be. Um, anything more valuable than, than we might have now. You detailed the evolution of the Secret Service from its inception. And it's always, it, it seems to me like there's a catch-22 between the presidency and the Secret Service. The president wants them to be laying low out of public sight, um, and yet the Secret Service is there to do their job and to protect the president. Has there always been a fantastic marriage between the two um, entities, or has there been a president that has really gotten under the skin of the Secret Service, whereas the Secret Service has turned around and said, well, if you can't allow us to do our job, um, then they have the accusatory pointing the fingers at one another. Um, have you always seen it as a perfect marriage through its inception, or do you have any good stories you could tell us? No, the only perfect marriage is mine. And, and the, these, uh, this does not. Um, that's a great question, but it's going to take a little bit of a, a complicated answer. Um, first of all, because there are no set ground rules, the Secret Service cannot order presidents around. They can't absolutely tell them what they have to do. 
So that leaves a, a big wedge for personality and political style. And um, it's described in the book, it's no secret, um, Secret Service agents regarded Lyndon Johnson as one of the most abusive presidents that they had seen. He delighted in mocking them, he delighted in um, pulling prankish jokes on them, and, and he wasn't all that friendly when they were around. So that's one model. Uh, other presidents um, whose personalities mesh more well with, this, with Secret Service protection are not a problem. And it, it's really dependent, so it's been, it's been a, a very uneven kind of evolution. And um, there were instances in which during the Nixon administration, they politically had the head of the White House detail removed uh, for being so uncooperative in their view of, of their agenda and what they wanted to go along with. So there, there's, no, there's no predicting it. Um, let me give you a, a current instance. I wasn't there, I'm not privy to this, but someday it'll make an interesting Secret Service story about what was going on in the immediate aftermath of the terrorist attacks. You will recall that President Bush's Air Force One uh, detoured to several very safe bases in the south. Elmendorf Air, Air Base was one. These are fantastically secure locations for the Strategic Air Command. And I can almost, if you'll allow me docudrama and fill it in, I can, I can hear the Secret Service saying, we can't go back to Washington because we don't know what's going on there. It's been the site of an attack. We do know that in an underground base in, in Nebraska, nothing is going to happen to you, so let's stay here. And the Politico is saying, that may be a good idea, but the world is watching. The country needs the president back in Washington to provide leadership. So, so even in a, in a generally cooperative relationship, I mean, events are going to tear this marriage apart if, if personalities and political pressures don't. Does the Secret Service have its own forensics division once an attempt is made, like the Reagan thing, and it becomes a crime scene? Or does the FBI take that over, and do they have any obligation to share what they learn with the Secret <laughs> Service if it helps them? Um, <clears throat> as best I can map it together, there was a delineation agreement, as they call it, which, which said that at the scene of an attempted assassination, the Secret Service's job is to get the protectee out of there as quickly as possible. Not even return fire if you don't have to. Just get the protectee out of there, shield, uh, shield from bullets, and secure the scene. And if you've got the assassin, hold on to the assassin until the FBI gets there. Uh, and then they're supposed to take over. Um, I, I didn't see that work letter perfect in the attempted assassination of President Reagan. Um, the Secret Service agents were involved with Hinckley and involved with the crime scene long after the FBI should have been there and they should have been someplace else, namely protecting the president. So, um, um, so it's not really clear, but, but uh, the Secret Service does have a, a forensic office of some kind. My view is that they're still dependent on the, the FBI laboratory, and that's only my view because I never got to find out what the forensic office does because they never responded to me about what it does, so I don't know what it does. But they have something called forensic, but I would really doubt if it's a, a huge laboratory that allows them to stand independently uh, of the FBI in these cases. Secret Service protection of college kids, like Chelsea's, like Carter's daughter, Chelsea Clinton, and the current Bush daughters. How far does that go down, and what can they do? Like when these girls have social lives, or, or when they're going to a sports event, if they're playing soccer, right. do they soccer? I know in road races, they participate. Well, we have a, there's a chapter in the book called Family Matters. And, and uh, it refers to um, first children, especially first daughters. And this is a negotiative process again. Um, evidently, um, I mean, certainly President Clinton had told the Secret Service to adopt a hands-off attitude with, with uh, Chelsea when she was attending Stanford. And, but I still, you know, paraphrase, would you like to be the young man dating Chelsea at Stanford, uh, imagining um, your Secret Service, the Secret Service checking your, your record? Um, there was this um, flap about the Bush twins and their underage drinking with the Secret Service present. Why didn't they you know, immediately prevent the girls from doing this or do something. Well, um, the speculation is, or the, the rumor is, that they were told, you know, let the girls be girls and let them grow up as best they can, and you can, you can watch and guard them, but try not to smother them. And so these agents had to figure out what that meant in the context of, of underage drinking at a bar. So it's, it's not clear, and, and there have been a lot of tensions. It's very difficult for the first children, of course, and it's difficult for the agents because uh, there are no real rules. 
I wonder, um, given the, the fact that they give their lives and <clears throat> they're in the line of fire constantly, you haven't mentioned if they're well paid. Or d is that information that's out there? I mean, as far as like, as far as compared to FBI agents or CIA agents, is uh, there any information available as yeah, they're, they're, salary? I mean, it's it's available on the web. It, it's sort of deceiving. The, the starting salaries are and, and GS um, nine to fifteen are comparable with FBI and whatever. They're under a hundred thousand, but they have all overtime and different kinds of perks. I don't know what their real remuneration is. I, I will say though that um, um, I think they're. They are claiming to me that they don't have a problem in a drain of Secret Service officers going to make more money, uh, that they all finish out their retirement at age 55. But I also notice that in the, in the retired directory of, of uh, Secret Service agents, most of them go on to uh, security companies and to provide security within companies. And you, we all know those jobs are going to pay two and three times more than, than risking their life for the president. Um, so they're they're compensated well in terms of general federal comparisons, but but not necessarily in terms of what they do. Uh, and I was amazed at the viciousness of the jokes against LBJ. I mean, they were really nasty, and I was surprised because he was a homegrown son. Mm -hmm. We had a uh, question here and here. I've always uh, believed that this was had something to do with Secret Service. I lived in San Francisco during the uh, when Nixon was vice president, and he was speaking in San Jose for a Republican candidate. A friend of mine. This was just after the uh, Checkers speech, and a friend of mine shouted from the audience, tell us a dog story, Dick. And I thought, oh, I've always felt it was the Secret Service who pulled him out of the audience and down to the front for Nixon to spend 20 minutes lambasting him and telling him how disrespectful he had been. The next morning, he was a naval architect, and the following morning when he went to the gate, his clearance had been lifted and he had been fired from the Navy. And that's what happened to my friend. Now that, I always thought, was some, you know, the act that the Secret Service had actually pulled him out of the audience. Well, you know, uh, part of the problem is, you know, there's no set line definition between what is potentially threatening behavior and, and what is your constitutional right. Uh, and, and the Secret Service comes up against that all the time. They have been sued. Uh, for trying to remove people uh, who claim they were just expressing themselves. And here's another thing they, they run into. Um, the, um, they don't like it when you put your hands in your pockets of a, of a deep coat. Because, of course, if you have a gun there, it comes out, the gun's already out. As a, you know. And so they frown on that. Well, there have been instances in which they end up in tussles with people who are wearing raincoats who refuse to remove their hands. And is it your constitutional right to keep your hands in your pockets, or is it their right to... Uh, to make those hands come out and check for a gun. So it's, it's a constant sort of problem with the hand. The image of the CIA has long been that it's an agency whose culture is dominated by graduates of elite Ivy League universities. Is there any similar kind of culture that you could identify uh, with respect to the Secret Service? No, not at all. Uh, <clears throat> these. Um, there are a variety of backgrounds and a variety of training, and um, I, I wouldn't say that you know any sort of educational or even financial elitism is, is anything that I've seen in their culture. And um, you know, if anything, um, I, I think their mentality is not that they belong to a, a an educational or socioeconomic elite, but they see themselves as a paramilitary core uh, that that comes from all walks of life. So that it's very different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. What I think is fascinating about the Secret Service in part is that we do see them. Unlike CIA agents, we see Secret Service agents doing some of their work, and I think we partly think that we understand them or know them. Uh, in reality, theirs is a very complex story 
a very complex organization, and uh, and yes, even enigmatic, as the um, as the subtitle suggests. Um, Laura asked me to say a little bit about the um, the project itself. The project was written almost a year to this day. Uh, I think it was November 16 that the actual writing began. But you'll recall that I had been doing research previously on the Secret Service for a number of years. And um, <clears throat> having Peter Stevens um, to wordsmith the project, of course, while I was doing uh, the other tasks, made it go along much faster uh, than if there were simply one person working on it. And <clears throat> the, um, the sources used, um, very briefly, one of the rich sources were the memoirs of Secret Service agents themselves, retired agents, and the biographies and memoirs of ex-presidents and their chiefs of staff. All of them in one way or another had something to say about their interactions with this agency, so that was a good starting point. Uh, there were some excellent government reports that were publicly available, believe it or not, and even some from think tanks like the Rand Corporation, analyzing White House security and talking about the history of uh, presidential protection. I did use the Freedom of Information Act to obtain documents regarding President Kennedy's assassination and the Secret Service's protective role therein, and also documents pertaining to the attempted assassination of President Ronald Reagan uh, in 1981. And then there were the interviews, which is the richest part of the book, even though the interviews are not many. Uh, they are hopefully very rich. The, um, the interviews with retired agents, the interviews with present agents, and the interviews with politicos, White House campaign people, uh, presidential campaign people who worked on the political, ran into that problem as well, that there was no functioning public affairs and there was the, <clears throat> the code of silence. And all but two of the agents that I talked to came from networking with other people. Uh, whether they retired or present, only in two cases did I approach somebody successfully who would talk to me as an author, as a political scientist. The rest of it was, was pure networking, and it was difficult at that. And more agents declined to talk to me than talk to me, which is, of course, their perfect right to do so. Let me talk a little bit about the history <clears throat> before getting to the more current events. Um, the Secret Service was created in 1865. And it was the last official act of Abraham Lincoln before he was assassinated. In fact, that afternoon, before he went to Ford's Theater uh, to be assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, he met with the Secretary of Treasury, and they agreed on the creation of the Secret Service. Uh, now, some think that that's a sad historical irony in the sense that here's a president about to be assassinated. They create an agency to protect presidents, but it doesn't do them any good. Well, indeed... Um, the Secret Service was not created to protect presidents. In fact, it was created solely to protect something that the system may have valued um, more highly than, than the lives of its political leaders, and that is our money. Uh, counterfeiting during the Civil War was so endemic that the, the actual currency system was threatened. So that's what the Secret Service was, was formed to do. And um, by the late, 18, <coughs> excuse me, late 1860s, we had two dozen swashbuckling agents running about the country with the guns that they had purchased on their own, uh, seeking out the counterfeiters. And their, their badges, if you will, their identification, their bona fides, consisted of a letter from the Secretary of the Treasury to each of them saying, so-and-so is a bona fide Secret Service agent. Well, it didn't take the bad guys long to catch on to that. And one of them wrote the Secretary of Treasury, got a response, lifted the signature, put it on a letter of his own concoction, walked into a Secret Service field office and essentially said, hi, as you can see, I'm here at Trail, interacting with, with uh, Secret Service agents. So it is a history from 1865 to the present, but we've pulled out of that history the uh, successes and failures, the major tragedies and triumphs that the Secret Service has had from the assassination of President Kennedy to what happened to the agency in the wake of 9-11 and, and all of the events along the way. This was difficult in a project in terms of getting information. Um, they don't call it the Secret Service for nothing. It is a secretive organization and does not like to talk about its work, does not like to reveal its methods, obviously. <clears throat> and then there is the code, uh, which Secret Service culture refers to, the code that says that um, ex-agents and current agents will not talk about two subjects. One is the personalities and foibles of the individuals that they protected, and second is um, how they go about their work. 
So anyone seeking to get first-hand information is, is confronting the code, and it's, it's not an easy code to break. Worse for <clears throat> this author, however, um, I ran into a double whammy, if you will, in that this was in the wake of 9-11. And because of 9-11, the Secret Service was so overmatched and understaffed that they virtually gave up talking to the public. In fact, in, in um, some frustrated moments, I would tell anyone who would listen that they should change the name of their public affairs office to private affairs or internal affairs because they weren't responding to at least this public, uh, and it was very difficult to, to get information. In fact, I had one agent from public affairs uh, return a phone call, which was a joy, uh, and he candidly told me that if it wasn't for the fact that I knew somebody who knew somebody in his office, that this phone call would not be happening because there wasn't time for it. And in fact, he ended up answering about 40% of the questions that I posed to him. He also said very candidly, look, everybody with a badge and a gun in this office, public affairs, is out protecting somebody at this point. So I read behest of the Secretary of Treasury, open your safe, give me all your seized counterfeit bills, and by the way, throw in the good cash as well, and I'll take that back to Washington. Uh, fortunately for the service, they discovered the scam before they opened the vault to this individual, but then someone thought it would be a good idea to issue badges. So badges were issued, and in fact, they're the very distinctive five-point um, shields that are still on the Secret Service shield and logo today, and agents... Um, in 1871 had to purchase their own badges for $25, which is a lot of money then. The good news was they got the money back when they retired if they turned in their badges. <clears throat> the, um, it's a very colorful history. I just give you some of the headlines. The Secret Service battled the Ku Klux Klan in the Rim States in the immediate uh, aftermath of the Civil War. They were just a law enforcement agency on hand who, who took up that role. They were our chief spying agency and counter-spy agency in World War I. They broke German spy rings quite successfully. They were what the CIA or the FBI would be today, and, and they had that sole responsibility, uh, which they would later um, lose. <clears throat> and so you might be wondering, when did they start protecting presidents and candidates and political leaders? Um, the first instance was 1894. And it's very interesting because it was the head of the Secret Service himself, uh, William Hazen, who on his own decided that he'd heard some rumblings in Colorado that some criminal types might have a grudge against President Cleveland. So on his own, he assigned two agents to the Cleveland White House. Without asking the Secretary of Treasury, without congressional authorization, the two agents just showed up. Well, evidently, the First Lady thought that was a dandy idea uh, because that summer of the same year, without telling her husband, the president, uh, she went to the Secret Service and asked them for agents to come to their summer home, which was up the road here in, in Marion, and to protect the family, especially the children, during the summer because she feared a kidnapping. So when, president, um, when the president showed up at his uh, summer home, uh, he was surprised to find Secret Service agents, but he, he accepted it. Now, you might think that given the birth of that idea and the notion of agents being present, protecting presidents and first families, that it was a linear curve or a, a straight line evolution to the present, but, but not so. The protective mission evolved in fits and starts, and it was for a long time not clear that it would be a mission and that it would be their mission. Uh, for example, uh, Congress, elements of Congress had a, an antipathy to giving agents over to the White House. They worried that it was another presidential perk, that presidents were going to have a, some sort of a police force or a, an armed force at their disposal, and they just didn't want to do that. Uh, <clears throat> they forbid it at certain times, in fact. And presidents themselves, some of them, weren't always sure they wanted Secret Service protection. Uh, imagine Warren G. Harding when he discovered that the investigation that brought down his administration, the Teapot Dome scandal, and sent his Secretary of the Interior to jail was spearheaded by Secret Service agents. And so they were less than welcome in the Harding White House after that. Um, Franklin D. Roosevelt flirted seriously with the idea of using FBI agents to protect him instead of Secret Service agents. Of course, this was at the behest of J. Edgar Hoover, who wanted every federal mission to be his and nobody else's, but the president um, gave some indications of trying to respond to that. So it wasn't until 1951 that Congress finally passed the permanent authorization for the Secret Service to protect 
president and provided the, uh, the annual funding for it. And um, that caused Harry Truman to quip, quote, the work of protecting me has at last become legal, unquote. And the Secret Service is a dual mission organization. Uh, it still does anti-counterfeiting. And by the way, uh, anti-counterfeiting doesn't roll off my tongue really well. So I'm going to talk about the counterfeiting mission, but I, I don't intend to 